Okay, so good afternoon. Um, today uh, we'll continue talking about uh, IO subsystem and hopefully, hopefully, hopefully uh, we get to uh, start talking about file systems. We'll see. Okay, so uh, we talked about magnetic disk. Um, we looked at some examples on the performance of magnetic disk. Uh, there is one more slide on the performance, so let's go through that slide and then uh, we move on to flash disks. OK, so um, in the, just as a, a reminder here, we saw that a, that a single um, Yeah, we saw that this uh, that a single uh, random access takes about nine point twenty four millisecond, right? Um, so let's go with that. Now, what happens if you have five hundred uh, random disk reads and it's uh, FIFO? then um, you're going to just simply multiply 500 with that uh, latency of a single random read to get 4.12 second. Um, now let's look at the same number of reads, but this time sequential. Now what does this mean? So if you have sequential reads, for the first read, you and if if these the, the first read is random, then you have to seek, um, and then you have to pay the rotation to get to your specific sector. But then once you get there, from there on, for the rest of the sectors, you don't need to pay the cost for seeking and rotation because they're just sequentially after each one after each other. So for this one, you're going to pay the seek time once, rotation delay once, and then from there on, you're going to just pay the transfer cost. Uh, so this gives you um, about 40x uh, performance improvement compared to this one. Um, now here is an example. This is like as uh, complicated as it could become uh, in terms of like, you know, quiz questions or uh, exam questions. So here I'm asking how large should the data be for us to achieve 80% of maximum disk uh, transfer rate? Now you should remember the graph that we saw previously. So this is the size of the data transfer and this is uh, effective bandwidth. It's always an increasing function. So as you increase the size, uh, your effective bandwidth increases. Now there is a max that is basically 100%, which is your peak bandwidth. So this is your peak bandwidth. We want to say 80% of peak bandwidth. What is the size? So what should be the size for us to achieve 80% of peak bandwidth? Now to solve this, um, we're going to make an assumption. So we know that the if you have sequential reads, you're going to get the best uh, latency, the lowest latency. So we're going to assume that we want to read sectors, sequential sectors. Now, we don't know how many sectors we want to read. It could actually be that we're reading more than one track. So all the sectors in one track, and then we have to move on to another track and read another track and another track and another track. So let's assume that we're going to read R tracks. Uh, we don't know this R and we want to find find out what this R is. So now 
your effective bandwidth is equal to the data size that you're transferring divided by the latency. Now, if you remember, you can go back to the formula that I showed you. Uh, you can rewrite this as peak bandwidth times transfer time divided by latency. Now, we want this entity to be 80% because we want our effective bandwidth to be 80% of this. So basically our equation boils down to finding what is the transfer time of sending this R uh, and what is the latency of doing that. Now, now transfer time um, is um, obvious, right? Because if you want to send R, uh, for each track, how long does it take for the head to go over that track? Well, the time for the head to go over all the sectors in a track is basically the rotation time. So the transfer time is going to be R times rotation time. And rotation time, we're getting it from before. It's eight milliseconds. So we're following the same example. Now, so we got the transfer time in terms of R. What is the latency? How long does it take for us to read this much data? Very similar to this sequential reads that we saw up there. We're going to pay the seek time. And we're not even going to take this time. We're not even going to uh, pay the uh, trans um, the rotation time because if we want to send the entire track, we don't care about any specific sector. So the moment the head gets on top of the track, we can start transferring. So we don't need to pay an extra time rotation time for the head to get to a specific um, sector. Any sector is good because we want to send all the sectors. So um, the latency is just a seek time. Um, and then after that, we're just going to transfer. Which is the transfer time. So now we have everything. The only variable here is R. So we can just put everything here and just solve for R. So 8R divided by 8R plus 5 is equal 0 0.8. And if you solve this, then R becomes 2.5. So this means that we need to send two and a half tracks. Now, if we know how many tracks we're sending, how much data are we transferring? Well, that's easy to calculate because uh, we know how long it takes to transfer the data. We know the number of tracks we have, and we know our peak bandwidth. So that gives us, so this is the, this is how long it takes. And while this is happening, we are transferring at the highest um, latency, uh, the highest bandwidth. So we're going to be transferring this much data. So eight kilobyte is what we're going to transfer. Now, due to all the complications of the physical constraints that the magnetic disk has, a lot of uh, intelligence has gone into designing good controllers for the magnetic disk. Uh, you want, you know, to have, for example, er error correction because of all the, you know, moving parts. Uh, there is an error that your head could be on top of another sector. There could be, you know, movements um, that, you know, the computer. I remember the, the old days computers when they were working. If you hit them uh, and they, you know. They could actually get a bad sector because while the plater was rotating, the head could you know, for all the movement 
things that you create could basically scratch the plater and then you might lose data, for example. Now, here I have listed at least three uh, things that were done um, or are done, but then there are so many other smart things that people have done. So the first one is the uh, sector sparing. As I mentioned, there is a chance that your sectors get uh, corrupted by movements, scratches, um, uh, difference in voltage, you name it. Everything is physical here. So the controller would keep some sectors uh, um, for this. So let's say this is your disk. Um, this is just an example. Your controller might, you know, reserve some sectors here and there and do not um, show these sectors to the to the to the rest of the system. So from the rest of the system, these sectors don't exist. The controller is keeping them for itself. Now, during the runtime, if the controller detects corruption of a sector, it can internally map this sector to one of these spare sectors that it has uh, kept uh, and use those. And this would be inter uh, this would be transparent to the rest of the system. This is called sector sparing. Now, this is fine, but if you have cases where for example, let's say the sector that got distorted, um, maybe it was here, uh, and you had a large file, maybe, all of them on the on the same track, and then one sector got distorted, and let's say we map this sector to some sector in an outer uh, track. Let me clean this up a little bit. So, let me also get rid of these spare sectors that I had. Now, what happens is um, the head, while it's reading the data, is in this track, in an inner track. Then it reaches the sector that is corrupted. At this point, the, the head has to come down to be placed on this track that your spur uh, sector is at. And then once it reads this sector, it has to go back. So you have to, you know, move your head uh, down. And then once it's done, you have to move your head up to the to the same track. And this adds a lot of latency. Uh, so one thing that again controllers do is if they detect that the the sectors are corresponding to the same um, file for example they would not only move the corrupted sector but also the entire sector the entire file to a sector on the same track so that next time you want to read this file you don't even start with this inner track you just come to the outer track this is called slip sparing so we're not just moving a single sector we're moving a bunch of them on the same track to not pay the high cost of you know going back and forth between these uh, different tracks uh, the other thing that was done is the track skewing. Now, let's say the head is here and it starts reading. So you have these sectors one after each other on this track. Now, specifically in the inner circles where the speed, uh, I mean, you have one uh, rotation per second, but then this, the area that your head um, covers the length that your that the head covers per second differs from which uh, diameter um, it's looking at. Now, if it is in 
the inner circles, it's going to go through sec uh, through sectors faster because there are less of them, right? So in outer uh, outer um, tracks, maybe you have. I'm just making it up. Maybe you have like I don't know, uh, one million sectors or one hundred sectors. So you go through one hundred sectors in ten seconds. In ten, um, what was it? Eight uh, millisecond. But in inner circles, you have a lot less sectors. You probably have fifty. And you go through them in eight milliseconds. So uh, the speed at which you uh, the go through your sectors increases in in uh, in the inner circles. Uh, am I making a mistake? In the outer circles. What am I saying? So here the speed is faster, right? Um, uh, excuse my. Lack of uh, mathematical understanding. OK, so when the speed is higher, there is a chance that you read. Uh, oh my God, you read one. Oh gosh, what is going on? You read one sector. And by the time you want to start reading the next sector, you have already crossed it. So the, the head has already moved from the, the next sector on the line. Increase the. OK. So if you have the sector numbers one, two, three, four, so you read number one and the, by the time you want to read number two, let me make it bigger. By the time you want to read uh, number two, you have moved to number three. So you have to wait for an entire rotation to come back to number two. And this is bad. This is like wasteful. So instead, uh, one of the things that they do is they rename these guys. So instead they do something like this. Instead of naming them sequentially. Um, they do this. Uh, they make the first one one, then the second one. The Then they leave the second one. They put the two for the other one and then three and then leave this one go for this one four leave this one go for the next one five something like this depending on the speed at which you're going um, uh, through these so that once you're done with this one you're already on the second one so you start reading this one instead of waiting for the head to come back to the one that you just moved from then you then, then the head moves to the third, so it misses this one, but that's fine because we didn't give it a number, so we come and read this one. Um, and then probably these get like 100, whatever number that we roll back, 101, 102, uh, so on and so forth. So basically we just m move over them. Got a question here. So tracks are different, uh, have a different number of sectors. Are the sectors between tracks aligned at the boundaries? How does the head know when a sector being and uh, begins and ends? I mean, obviously, obviously you have. Um, I don't exactly know the physics of how the the head knows these things, but obviously, I mean we actually saw this example here that, that um, I think I mentioned it uh, in this slide where the amount of data that you can, um, the area corresponds to the storage you have. And the area here is less, is a fraction of area in the outer circle, right? So it really depends on area. So you have more sectors on tracks outside than the, the inside tracks. Um, it's, it's the, sorry, the, you have more sectors in on the outside tr uh, outer tracks than the number of tr uh, sectors on inner tracks. Now, how does the, the head 
know the boundaries? How how does it recognize them? I bet there are very interesting techniques and electronics going there, but I have no idea. But generally speaking, the area is proportional to a storage. So you can store more data in outer on outer tracks than you can uh, on inner tracks. Okay, so here is a here is a is an example from 2018. Um, you should now be able to look at the data sheet of these devices and understand what they mean. So this one, the first one is basically the capacity, the number of platers, the number of heads is usually twice as many. Uh, they, if you look at the data sheet, it usually gives you the average seek time for this disk, um, the size of each sector in this in this particular device is four kilobyte each sector, the rotation uh, time and um, and the speed, the interface that this guy supports, um, the maximum transfer rate. So this one is usually when you have um, sequential reads, and then uh, cache. So this cache can be used for uh, different things, right? So for example, if you're writing to this disk faster than what the disk can actually write on the platers, then the data can get cached. And then later on, once the disk is done with uh, storing the previous data, it can go to the cache and store the rest. Uh, hopefully, you know, you're sending data for writes less frequently than the device can handle. Otherwise, obviously, you, you're going to um, you're going to have a problem. But yes. To have a key that you could use for buffering data, the same for reads, maybe I mean in this in this example, you're um, you, you can. What is six gigabit per second? So six gigabit is six times. Um, let's go with one thousand megabit, uh, per, and then e divided by eight. So uh, somebody does this. So divided by two, that's three. That's four. And then this becomes 25. Um, so this uh, supports 750 megabyte per second. So you you can you can transfer faster than what your device can support, right? So your your maximum transfer rate for your device is 261 megabyte per second. The maximum transfer rate for your uh, interface for your um, data transfer bus uh, is 750 megabyte per second. So if you remember, I, we discussed, we always look at the, the bottleneck. In this case, the bottleneck is the device. So the device is uh, slower than what the bus can provide. Uh, there could be cases where the device, I mean, we will see it, with SSD, the device could potentially go faster than what the uh, SATA bus can do, right? In that case, the cache could be used for a buffering. Let's say you're reading from from your flash, and you can read internally faster than what you can transfer. In that case, you read from your flash, you put it in the in the cache, and then the bus uses the cache to transfer the data to to your uh, to the system. But anyhow, cache sits here as a buffer between the internal of the device and the and and the system. And then you can actually compare that with a device from 1986. The capacity was 30 megabyte. 
uh, the seek time was uh, 30 to 40 millisecond. Um, and then the, the transfer rate was uh, the top one megabyte per second. So we have come a long, long way, and and you, we'll we'll just compare later on HDD with SSD. So you can also look at that as well. Okay. <clears throat> now the last thing I want to discuss before we move on to flash is disk scheduling. So. Your disk controller, your HDD controller is going to receive some requests uh, for reads, for writes. And these requests are going to be queued inside the system, inside the hard disk. Now, there are ways to schedule them. <clears throat> the first simplest way of doing it is F uh, FCFS. Now, this is kind of fair, right? The first request that comes I'm going to answer it the first one and then the order I'm going to preserve the order now this is good but it gives you really bad performance we saw it right we looked at that example where we had 500 random um, reads the reason this is going to be bad is because there is no reason for the requests that you get to be on the same track so one request could be on the inner track, the other request could be on the outer track, and then you go back and forth in and out. So the arm keeps moving and that, you know, it slows down the system. Uh, the second one you can have is the shortest seek time first. So you look at all the requests in your queue, you look at the place of your head, wherever the, the arm is, wherever the head is, sorry, the track that the head is currently at and you basically pick the request that is closer by so uh, for example let's say um, let's say if the if the head is you know this is the track that the head is uh, currently looking and then let's say you have requests um, here here and here so you first pick this request, then pick this request, and then pick this request, right? So you just move uh, to the next close one, and then the next close one, and the next close one. It could well be that this guy was the first one that came, but then you're going to visit it the last one uh, because it's the furthest from where the head currently is. Now this basically avoid it. It's good for performance, obviously, because we're just making short moves, but it's uh, bad for um, uh, fairness. L let's say you get a lot of requests on tracks here, then you're going to stay here forever, right? Uh, because the head is going to just move between those tracks because that's close by. And then the this uh, single request that you might have actually gotten the first one, which is the, uh, the furthest to where the head is right now, would starve. Um, then there are other um, algorithms that you could do. Uh, one is called the scan. So the, the idea is that the arm, you know, just moves in one direction and answers all the requests that it can in that move and then comes back from the from the middle comes to the outer and then um, does the request in that order. Now this one avoids a starvation because the the arm is basically moving uh, constantly and it is guaranteed to visit the inner circles or inner tracks. Um, it also has low seek time, obviously, because you, as you go, you answer the requests, but it actually favors the middle ones uh, a lot because uh, uh, because as you can see, you know, the um, so if you are here, that um, the time it takes for the head to 
let's say the head just moved from you, so you came right after the head moves your track. Now you have to wait for the entire uh, going back and forth for the head to come back to you, right? So it takes a lot of time. Now, if you're in, in the middle here and the head moves from you, the amount that you have to wait is just a little. So the, the head is going to just go to the center and come back to you. So your wait time, if you miss the bus, if, if you assume that the, the, the head is the bus and you miss one, uh, your wait time depends on which track you are. So there is no constant wait time for everyone, right? And that's unfair. So if, if the track is in uh, middle circles, then it's lucky. If it is in outer circles, it's unlucky. Uh, so that's the, the problem with this one. Now, there are ways to kind of uh, address this, right? The one is CS scan, which uh, moves the, this, the, the arm in only one direction. So the arm only goes from outer circles to inner circle and then immediately comes back and does this and repeats this again and again and again. So this fixes the wait time for everyone, right? Uh, so no matter where you are, your uh, your maximum wait time is basically how long it takes for the for the head to go in one direction from the outer track to the inner track. Um, and then there is the RCSCR, which um, So which th this one adds another optimization, um, which is, um, let me see if I can. So with 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 this one, with the with the CS scan, look at the sequence. So this one becomes one, and then we're going to go to the next track, do two. Then we're going to go to the next track, do three, and then uh, finally go to the last one, four, so, because the arm is moving in that direction. Now, with RCS scan, we are also considering the rotation of the disk. So when we go here, we calculate that if we move in this direction, by the time we get here, two will come to us so we don't need to pay rotation time to read two so compare that to three where we probably have to move and then wait for the three to come to us so this is a lot of rotation whereas i can just move here and then two will come to me right so the rcs scan not only considers how far the in track uh, the request is, but also how much rotation it needs for that to come to us and then minimizes uh, accordingly, right? Uh, so that's our CS scan. So generally speaking, the head is still moving from outer track to inner track and then comes back immediately, does this again. But then in sequencing the request, it also sometimes does this optimization where it might go for an inner track and then slightly come back to answer to uh, respond to an outer track. Uh, so, you know, you uh, in the example that we were seeing, what's going to happen is um, everything is going to be sequenced uh, so perfectly. You're going to read here move the head here without rotation two is going to come to you so you're going to read it by the time this all whole this whole thing happens three is here right three has moved uh this way so then um you just go back by the time you get back three will also be here so you read three and uh that was optimized for you right you didn't um because otherwise you should have just gone to here and then waited for three to come and then once the three was done then you have to move and by the time two would be here 
and then wait for two to come. So by just doing this uh, quick optimization, we improve the latency of the reads. And there are so many more. So these are just examples. Um, this is another example of intelligence that has gone to designing these controllers. Um, OK. So here is a here is a FCFS. Uh, again, as you can see in FCFS, you're going to see these drastic moves because it just depends on which request comes first. So we go to this one, to this one, and then we come back, go like it constantly does this because the requests are random, right? So by the way, this this is just the sector number. Um, 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 actually, no, th these are the requests and these are the uh, track numbers. So we're getting requests on this track, we're getting requests on this track and so on and so forth. And then you can see the, you know, so this is track number. Um, and then, um, and this is time. So you see the head moving. Uh, between tracks. Now this one is uh, a scan, so it goes in one direction and then comes back. And then goes this way, so so that's a scan. Uh, this is see a scan. So you go in one direction and then you immediately come back. And then go again. OK, so. Final notes. Um, this performance depends on the sequence of. Uh, requests that we're getting. It depends. If you have random reads um, and you implement something like a FIFO or first come first serve, then your performance is going to be really bad. If you have sequential reads on the same track, then that's the perfect uh, scenario for it for a disk. Um, uh, what else? Yeah, if you have a if you have a uh if you if in your disk you're not getting a lot of requests then it really doesn't matter how you handle your requests because it's like you know back in days when the io was the the bottleneck of the system and there was uh sorry yeah when when the io was really slow it didn't really matter how you do things um the if you get a burst uh, then it's both good and bad. So it's good because um, you have opportunity to sort your request to get to a really good schedule. For example, the CS scan or whatever. If you have a lot of them, then you can um, efficiently do them by moving uh, or ordering the request in the in the best way possible. It's also bad because um, um, because they could all be random or depending on how you're implementing them, uh, it, it could overwhelm your system. OK, so there's not much left to talk about disks. Let's talk about uh, flash memory. This is the second um, second um, technology we're going to talk about uh, in terms of permanent storage. So the, the technology is not actually that uh, new. It, it was um, uh, introduced in 1995. Um, then uh, it was. Um, so I don't exactly know if I want to talk about these actually, because we don't have much time. I prefer to move on from these. I'm going to just very briefly tell you the high level. The high level is when you read from a flash, it's fast. 
when you want to write to a flash, it's uh, it's a hassle. Um, so I think th that's all we need to know at this point. Um, reading to flash is easy, but writing to a flash cell requires the flash cell to be first erased and then written to. And this is a this is a um, process that eventually could wear the frac the flash off. So there there are certain number of times that you can write to a flash cell because the process of writing requires a lot of voltage to be applied to the flash cell and it kind of distorts uh, the, the 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 cell and there is a maximum number of times that you can do this uh, and after that it will the, the cell will die and you cannot write to that cell anymore and so as we move on i'll talk about why this is important to know because we, we as an operating system and as a um, system designer let's say um, we have an we we can address this by, uh, for example, making sure that we're not writing to the same cell again and again and again. Maybe we can distribute our writes. So, for example, if you have a file that is constantly being updated, you probably don't want to uh, store that file in a fixed place in your flash because then you're writing to the same cells again and again and again. So then those cells could die while the other cells in your flash are just left uh, unchanged. So you could uh, distribute your writes over your flash. OK. The benefit of flash is basically we're, we're eliminating all these moving parts that we had in magnetic disk which was uh, introducing uh, all sorts of problems with uh, with faults, with uh, bad latency, uh, with weight, uh, and so on and so forth. So we don't have that, so it's good. Um, we still have a problem, which is basically those writes uh, being very expensive, but but at very least we don't have to pay the, the performance price that we were paying. Uh, with uh, magnetic disks. Um, now, this is an overview of flash uh, controller. Uh, so, your flash controller is um, is uh, in charge of, you know sequencing the reads and sequencing the stores and distributing them. Oh, I got a question here. Don't modern computers use flash memory in their SSDs? So is the maximum number of writes really high now? Um, OK, that, that's a good question. Yes, all, almost all SSDs have flash memory. Now, the maximum number of times you can write to flash memory is limited. Uh, it is improving, right? It's we're capable of making flash cells that can tolerate more writes, but eventually they will die. Uh, so these um, uh, algorithms that I talked about, which distribute writes over your entire SSD, make sure that your entire SSD dies. Um, uh, you know, it, it survives a longer life cycle. But yes, so whenever you're buying an SSD, always make sure that you know that it's lifespan. Uh, so they do have lifespans. And um, let's say after five years, after six years, you probably want to get a backup and then change them. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, SSDs do have flash memory. And yes, uh, they do have a lifespan. They, they can't survive, you know, uh, huge writes, huge uh, volume of writes for, you know, 10 years, 20 years. They're going to wear off. 
Okay, so when you're reading from Flash, uh, there is no need for seek, there is no need for uh, rotation, we don't have those anymore. Uh, and reading and writing, reading basically is very similar to how you read from your DRAM. So you have your address, you send your address through the wires, and then you read the, the flash cells uh, corresponding to that address. So it's pretty fast. So if you have random reads, no problem. You can, you can definitely do random reads. Now, um, the... So this example is showing you that uh, basically you're limited by the by the bus that you have, right? So your flash can read as fast as possible. It doesn't have any latency, right? So you can read as much as you want. So you're limited basically by your SATA, the whatever. If if it is PCIe, then you are limited by your PCIe. If it is SATA, you're limited by your SATA. SATA. So Let's say if the unit of uh, of uh, reading is uh, four kilobytes. So by the way, flash also has uh, the the unit of read in magnetic disk was sector. The unit of read in flash disk is a page. Um, it's it's called flash pages. So for a page of four kilobytes, uh, you can read that page in as low latency as 10 um, uh, microseconds. So it's pretty, pretty darn fast. Uh, you can compare this with with uh, with the numbers that we saw in the in the. Magnetic disk and it's it's a lot different. So with magnetic disk just to have a seek, you saw that you were having to pay four millisecond. So compare this four millisecond just to have a seek to this 10 microsecond to just read your entire sector, your entire page of four kilobyte. So it's a lot faster, obviously. You have, I don't exactly know you guys, you're, you're a lot younger than I am. So like back in days, we turn off our computer and we, we would just go uh, grab a cup of coffee or something for the computer to boot up. So it would take long, like, I don't know, five minutes for the system to boot up uh, from uh, from HDD. Uh, now you boot up your system from SSD within a few seconds, 10 seconds and your system is up. So this is why. OK, so going back to our formula for latency, we're just paying the queue time, uh, the controller time, and then the transfer time. So this was different. With disk, we had two more elements, if you remember. We had uh, we had seek time here, uh, plus we had rotation. And both of both of these two guys were were physical components moving around, and it, and they were absolutely not fast. So we have eliminated this. Um. So and then you get your highest bandwidth no matter if it is sequential reads or if it is uh, random reads. It doesn't really matter because again, we're to, it's just you're putting num uh, putting voltage on the on wire. Uh, you're not waiting for a head to rotate. So writes, as I mentioned, are different. Are a little bit uh, more difficult. So. Uh, in order for you to write, you have to first erase something. You have to uh, uh, apply really high voltage to your cells to erase them. And as a result, you could damage your memory cells. Uh, and we discussed this, that this means that your SSD uh, has uh, a limited lifespan. Uh, the controller uses uh, error code correction. Uh, in in case that you, some of your cells are dead, and it also performs wear leveling. So this is basically 
load balancing the rights over all the cells. Uh, so you can only write to empty pages. Uh, that's that's your constraint. So you have to first erase the entire page. Excuse me to then be able to write to each byte of that page. Now. Um, when you want to erase, you don't just erase a single page. You usually uh, erase bunch of blocks. So when you're writing, you're writing a single page, which is kind of like just a four kilobyte. But when you're erasing, because of all the, you know, high voltage has to be applied and all of this, I don't exactly actually know, I shouldn't pretend that I know the physics of it, but from the system's point of view, we're told that when the cells want to be erased, we have to erase a large area. Uh, we have to erase an entire block. So a single block um, has, you know, a, no a, a certain number of pages in it. So you erase an entire block and then you start writing. So how is this going to impact us? Let's see. So in this example, as it's uh, saying, you have to erase 64 pages uh, every time you want to erase. Now, high level, this means that when we want to update a page, we cannot update it, we cannot write it um, on the same page that this page resided. So let's say let's say there is this page here, page, and this is like your flash, obviously. Uh, this is page A. So you read this page and then your program makes an update to this page. And let's say this is, I actually have the slides for it. So why am I doing this? So let me, let's go here. Um, I'll go back to the slides. So, uh, so these are blocks. So let's look at the first picture here. Um, I have, I'm showing you two blocks. There's a block X and there is a block Y. Uh, so let's say initially both of these two blocks are empty. Both of them are erased. Then you write A, B, C, and D, right? So you write them. Well, you have three uh, erased blocks you can write. So that's fine. Let's say then you read A, B, and A, B, C, D, and um, you want to change them, right? So let's say later on you want to store A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime. Well, you cannot write it where it originally was because th these are not erased. So you cannot write it there. So what you do, you basically mark these as invalid pages and then write your new pages in empty in empty pages that you had. So free pages, you, you pick free pages, you write them there. Now, at some point as a, um, gar a garbage collector comes in and figures out that in this block, there, there are garbage. So this A, B, C, D, that we no longer need because we have written an updated version of them. These are garbage, so we need to garbage collect. Now, how do we garbage collect? Well, I can't just garbage collect. I cannot just erase these A, B, and C, and D. I cannot erase just those pages. I have to erase the entire block. So what do I do? Well, I am going to copy all the active pages that are not garbage in a new uh, block, and then I can just erase the entire block. So this is the sequence that happens in your flash disks. Now this is called, um, again I think I do have a, a slide for this, but this is called a, um, a write amplification. 
So basically a single write, so you know, this single write of A prime, for example, or B prime, C prime, and D prime, ends up creating a lot of writes, right? Because you don't know when the garbage collector is going to be activated. Um, you write something, and as a result of your write, a garbage page is created, and then when the garbage collector wants to garbage collect, it's going to create a lot of more writes. So all these new pages that we wrote here, these are new writes. So um, a tsunami of writes come after, for example, a single write. So this is called write amplification in your flash. So you think that you're just writing to a single cell, but in the background, you're basically writing to a lot of different pages and then you're erasing some pages. And this garbage collection is very important to have because otherwise, if you don't garbage collect here and you start writing in this page, then it might be uh, the case that later on you don't have enough uh, pages to do the to to do your garbage collection, right? So it might it might uh, complicate your 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 things, your writes, and then it could delay your writes. So you always want to have these free blocks so that when the write comes, you can just write it somewhere. You have three pages. If you just wait and wait, wait for garbage collection, that could uh, that could then cause a long delay uh, for garbage collection to happen before you are able to write again. So this garbage collection usually happens in the background. OK, so let's go back. Um, yeah, so we were talking about this now. All of this happens with uh, in control in in the flash memory controller. So the flash memory controller uh, is in charge of mapping logical flash uh, uh, pages to physical uh, uh, to physical flash pages. As I mentioned uh, in the in the example, this page A could be anywhere in in the flash. The flash controller is moving these pages all around. So it has to have a mapping of which virtual pages are mapped to which physical pages because operating system just knows the virtual pages, right? It says give me this uh, block or this, um, uh, you know, four kilobyte from this file. Operating system doesn't know what the flash memory controller is doing internally. It just tells it, give me this, this many bytes. So the flash controller should know where each page resides in, internally. So it maintains this logical flash page to physical uh, uh, flash page mapping internally. It also makes sure that it uh, load balances the writes as we discussed. You don't want to just keep writing to the same cell again and again and again and then uh, wear it out. So you you do that. The other thing that the flash does is this, is sector sparing, very similar to what we did with, um, with the disk. So you keep some of your space uh, without showing it to the rest of the system in case you need, uh, in case you don't have any extra uh, pages to move things around. Or in case some of your uh, sec uh, flash cells die. So when you buy some SSD, it might internally have more storage than it's advertising to you. And those uh, storages, th those cells are kept in case some cells die, they could be used. Um. OK, so we talked about garbage collection. I mean, I just talked about it as in, a, in an example, so I think that's enough. I, I can move on. OK. Oh, so there is one more thing. Um. Yeah, one more thing. So. It's important for the flash uh, controller to get some signal 
from the operating system on dead pages. Meaning that let's say that your user deletes a file, right? Operating system doesn't need to tell the hard disk that, you know, this file is dead because operating system could potentially just internally in its file system uh, discard those uh, virtual pla uh, uh, virtual flash pages, for example. So we'll use them later on for some other file. So from the operating system's point of view now, these virtual pages are now available. Now, if you don't tell the controller, the controller cannot garbage collect those pages because it doesn't know that these are gone. And if it can't garbage collect, then that's bad. So garbage collection is always good because it keeps the flash uh, ready for the writes to come. So as a result, uh, the there has been some uh, interface between the operating system and the flash memory controller so that the operating system can send a signal to the flash controller telling the flash controller that these pages I no longer want them so you can garbage collect them so this is called the trim command um, so so that's what the last bullet is about OK, so we also talked about uh, this write amplification. So I guess I can move on from that. And, you know, this actually contributes to a shortening of the life cycle of your SSD. So in essence, you're just writing once, but then this write amplification means that a lot of writes are happening uh, in the background because of that one single write. And well, we know that writes are, uh, there is a limit on how many times you can write uh, to your flash. Okay. So the, the latency of the write is basically you queue things and then your controller has to find a free block for you to write and then you have the transfer time. And then you get your highest bandwidth independent. It's irrespective of uh, the, the address because it's going to be mapped virtually. Uh, there is no moving parts, so sequential writes or random writes, it doesn't really matter. Um, in terms of at least uh, the the hardware, it's just limited by how many empty pages you have. Now let's look at a, a an example of the current SSD. So I think this is from either last year or two years ago. Um, let's look at some of these numbers and see if we can make sense of it. So this one is telling us that this is a PCIe. Um, so this this is the um, the and it's PCIe NVMe. So that that's that's the NVMe um, interface. Um, this comes with different capacities. So you know. 250, uh, 500, all the way to two terabytes. So compare that to that 14 terabyte uh, um, HDD that we saw. Um, although the gap is actually closing, so I actually haven't have a slide talking about the gap. Okay, what else can we make sense of here? Now this guy is interesting. So this one has a huge uh, cache in it. So you can cache data um, um, up to two gigabyte internally. Um, and, and again, the reason could be that you read much faster than you can transfer or vice versa. You write much uh, faster than what the device can uh, can handle. So cache is just a buffer. Uh, usually put. But 
in the case of um, of SSD, this cache is usually used for writes. Um, so this this usually is right is uh, for writes because we discuss writes are are kind of a slow. Uh, so you can just cache them and we'll see how this is going to show itself in numbers uh, as I move down to this uh, data sheet. I'll talk about this. Um, OK, what else can we see? So it's a lot. I mean, it's obviously a lot smaller. I don't know if you you guys have seen these NVMe uh, uh, SSD cards. They're very thin, very um, uh, lightweight. Uh, not comparable at all with the HDDs. Um, now here comes the interesting things. Um, so you have the sequential read numbers and sequential write numbers. Um, obviously, reads are faster than um, than writes. What else do we see here? Now, when it comes to random reads and random writes, uh, you see some weird stuff here. Uh, somebody asked me actually. So look at these numbers. Uh, let me see these two. Random reads, you can do 19K uh, IO operation per second, whereas random writes, you can do 62K. So it's kind of like you have a lot more random uh, write bandwidth. The reason for that is precisely this DRAM uh, cache here. So when you write to SSD, you can cache this write in your DRAM. And then later on, once you, you know, find a um, empty block or empty page, you can write it eventually down to uh, the flash cells. But when you're reading, you cannot cache it. You have to go and read it, right? So that's why the performance of writes is higher because it's kind of we're cheating. We're actually not writing in flash cells. We're writing it in our DRAM cache, and then later on we'll write it to the cells. But for reads, we actually have to go and read from flash cells. We can't cache reads, obviously. Although if you have them cached, then you can ca read from your cache. That's that's another uh, thing. But if, if you're reading random cells, you have to go and read from those cells. But if you're writing to random cells, then you don't need to write it immediately. You can buffer writes and then write them later on. You don't need so you can acknowledge uh, the operating system that OK, don't worry about it. You're done. I will eventually write these uh, on the on the flash cells um, so that therefore the write performance is better. Um, yeah, so so that's that y you sort of see the same uh, the same here. And to be honest, I'm actually not sure what this QD32 and QD1 means, so spare me that one. OK. Um, there was a video I used to show students about this NVMe. Uh, um, uh, we have a little bit of time. Maybe it's uh, maybe I can show that to you as well. Let's see. <sighs> yeah, maybe I can show you this. Uh, Hello, everyone. And this. OK, let me. It's a it's a fun video, actually, so. Let's see if I can. 
share screen. So let me know in the chat if you cannot hear. I'm hoping that you can. This video, we're going to talk about M.2 Non-Volatile Memory Express Solid State Drives, or SSDs. Now, these drives are relatively new and have only been around for a few years now. And just like regular 2.5-inch SSDs that we're more familiar with, M.2 SSDs also use flash memory for data storage and... Oh, I guess you're not, you're not seeing it. Why? They are very fast, but the difference between a regular 2.5 inch SSD and an M.2 SSD is that the M.2 is a totally different form factor and it connects to a different type of slot. The M.2, which was formerly known as a next generation form factor, is a standard that's used for mounting expansion cards internally. Now, SSDs have dramatically passed mechanical hard drives as far as speed, and this is because SSDs have no moving parts because they use flash memory for data storage as compared to mechanical hard drives that use rotating magnetic disks to store data. But in recent years, SSDs have gotten faster and are more capable of moving data at a faster rate. So in order to unlock the full capability of SSDs, engineers needed a new technology to unlock the faster speeds of SSDs. And that's where M.2 and NVM Express come in. Now, prior to M.2 and NVM Express, the latest interface standard that was widely used for hard drives and SSDs was SATA 3.0. And the standard that was used for an interface for software to communicate with SATA was the Advanced Host Controller Interface, which is better known as AHCI. Now, AHCI was developed primarily for mechanical hard drives. It wasn't made or optimized for SSDs, and that's mainly because it dates back to 2004. So it was creating a bottleneck for today's SSDs. The SATA 3.0 bus with AHCI allows data transfer speeds at a theoretical rate of 600 megabytes per second, which is pretty fast. However, M.2 NVM Express SSDs do not use the SATA bus. They instead use the PCI Express bus, which is much faster than SATA. So by using the PCI Express bus with an optimized protocol like NVM Express, these allow SSDs to transfer data at a rate of 3 gigabytes per second, which is extremely fast. So M.2 SSDs with NVM Express is roughly five times faster than SATA and AHCI. Now this speed will vary depending upon what motherboard you are using and which SSD, but regardless, it's still a lot faster than SATA SSDs. NVMe or Non-Volatile Memory Express is a communications protocol specifically developed for SSDs. It basically reduces the CPU overhead and streamlines operations, which lowers latency and increases input and output operations per second. Or in other words, it's fast. NVM Express was developed to fully take advantage of the capability of PCI Express storage devices and to perform many of the input-output operations in parallel, meaning that many calculations are done at the same time. A large job is broken down into several smaller jobs that can be processed independently. Now, this is very similar to how a multi-core CPU works with multiple threads, where the CPU cores work independently of each other to perform certain tasks. Another advantage that NVM Express has over AHCI is what's called the command queue. The command queue is a queue for enabling the delay of a command to be executed. So in a nutshell, as commands are sent to a storage drive, it gets into a line or queue. Then uh, so first of all, I love that part that he's like, in other words, it's fast. <laughs> so that was my favorite. Now, this command queue is what we saw in FCFS, for example, or in CSCAN um, and so on and so forth. So you are getting these requests. Uh, they get queued in your command queue, and then you can potentially do all sorts of optimizations on reordering these guys. So now let's see how it works with NVMe. As each command is finished executing by the drive, it goes to the next command in the queue. Now, AHCI allows one queue with up to 32 commands in the queue, but NVM Express allows 64,000 queues and with each queue capable of 64,000 commands. So in theory, if you were to max out NVM Express, you can fulfill a staggering 4 billion 96 million commands. The M.2 SSD connects to the... Uh, so obviously we can't, right? Because uh, we're also so there is there is, we also have the bottleneck of how fast uh, the SSD can uh, 
it gets those commands uh, executed. I'm going to actually stop here. So if you're interested, just watch the last minute of this. Uh, so let's move on uh, with the four minutes I have left uh, to finish up this. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. OK. OK, so moving on. Um, I'm going to actually move on from this one as well. So this is like an article that was written, I think, in the New York Times uh, talking about uh, the because when you write to your SSD, your you trap electrons on flash disk flash cells and electrons have weight. So um, technically a full uh, SSD is heavier than uh, an empty SSD. So they did this uh, quirky <laughs> study to show that. So I'm going to move on from that. So uh, in summary, the SSDs uh, have low latency, high throughput, uh, no moving part, no no moving parts, <laughs> very fast, uh, lightweight, um, less. Um, uh, sensitive to movement um, and um, the reads are at almost uh, highest speed possible, very close to what you can do with with your uh, DRAM. Um, and then the cons is basically uh, it's expensive or more expensive than HDDs. Um, the writes are uh, not homogeneous uh, and uh, they might not be, uh, you know, taking them the same amount of time every time you write. It depends on the state of your uh, garbage collector and the, the state of your free uh, blocks and so on and so forth. So sometimes it takes time, sometimes it doesn't. But overall, writes are hassle. Um, and then it has a limited life cycle. Uh, so. Now here is a is a, in one shot putting these two together. Um, access time, uh, well, SSD beats uh, HDD. The same with random I/O performance. The same with reliability. Obviously, energy saving because you don't have any moving parts, so you consume less power. Um, CPU power the same. How much CPU you need. Um, yeah, so yeah, I guess that's that's self-explanatory. OK, that's it. OK, so we we, we kind of finished um, uh, talking about uh, IO. I'm so sorry I didn't have more time to go deeper. Um, I wish I had. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't. So next um, on uh, Tuesday, um, next Tuesday, which is the last class, uh, I will discuss uh, file systems again very briefly. We won't be able to talk much about file systems, but I will provide lectures from uh, uh, EC350 previous years uh, so that if you're interested in knowing more about file systems, you can actually uh, watch those lectures. Thank you so much for sticking around. Um, um, take care, be safe. We'll talk to you on Tuesday. Bye.